We're starting off today talking about English translations that we have access to today. So I have a lot of people that have asked the question before, what translation should I use? What Bible translation should I use? I get that question like quite a bit. Do you guys get that, that question ever in your ministry? And often people want me to say, X translation is it. If you're not using this translation, you're not reading the real Bible. Like, this is the one that has everything figured out. That's what a lot of people expect the answer to be, and yet that's not an answer that I can ever give, because that's just not a true answer to answer the question in that way. So we're going to look at what factors we should use to choose a translation for us to read and study in, in Scripture. And you guys have done the... Uh, translation comparison assignment. So as we go along, we'll talk about different factors and I'll pause. I want to hear some feedback from you guys about what did you notice as you were reading through a book of the New Testament in eight different translations? What did you notice about each of these factors that we're going to walk through? I'm going to walk through, here's the outline, five key factors choose for choosing a translation today. So we're going to unpack each of these a little bit more, but to give you the quick outline, we'll talk about the, uh, the source of original languages. We'll talk about reliable textual criticism. We'll talk about philosophy of translation, the originality factor, and then just finally when it comes down to actual practical use. So the first factor is the source of original languages. And when you choose a Bible today, you need to ask the question, does the Bible that I'm looking at go back to the original Greek, Hebrew, and, inter and, and Aramaic, um, as opposed to a secondary or a tertiary translation? You might have heard before that the Bible is a translation of a translation of a translation, but that's false. Um, our English Bibles today are one step removed and only one step removed from the original Greek and Hebrew, that they, they only need to be one step removed. Now, it's possible for them to be two steps removed if you are reading a, an English translation that is a, a translation off of the Latin Vulgate, which was a translation off of Greek or off of Hebrew. Um, that would be a secondary translation, but we're looking for a, a primary translation. Another way that it might be something less than an original translation is if it is a paraphrase. Paraphrase is, is a different kind of creation. It's not necessarily a translation. What you do in a paraphrase is you take someone else's translation, like the King James, and then you put it into more modern uh, idioms and, and contemporary ways of, of speaking. That's what was happening with the living Bible in the 1970s, where someone took the King James and rephrased it so that he could read it to his kids and that they could understand it. There's value to that, especially on a devotional level, but not on a study or you know serious in-depth exegetical level but that's why we're asking the question the first factor is does this go back to the original languages and one of the best tools that you can use is an interlinear i gave you a uh, link here for mounts's reverse interlinear uh, of the new testament on bible gateway um, before we look at that one here's an actual greek interlinear so you can, and I hope that you have seen these before. This is a tool that everyone should own. If you want to do serious Bible study at all, and I hope that you all do, you need to own an interlinear. This interlinear is organized by the, uh, you can see that there's, there's blue, more blue, black letters, red, and then blue again. Well, the black through the middle of each line, that's the actual Greek word. And then above that line is a way of pronouncing that word. And then above that in the blue is a number. That number is the number that you would look up if you wanted to find this word in a Greek concordance. And then you can see uh, how to pronounce the word in the second blue line, the Greek word itself in the black. Then below that in the red is a kind of word for word translation, what that, that word equals most. However, it equals most into English. However, that's not the way that language works. Language is not an equal code where one word in one language equals another word in another language. Um, sometimes there's one word in Greek that might take five or six words in English to say, or sometimes there's 
three words in English that we can, or three words in Greek that we can accomplish with one word in, in English. So those, those are, are differences there, but an interlinear has a lot of value. The very bottom blue line of each row is a code for grammatical parsing. We spend lots of time in our Greek classes dealing with parsing, but it basically explains, is it a verb? Uh, is it an indicative verb or a subjunctive verb? Is it first person, second person, third person? Is it plural or is it singular? Is the participle masculine, um, feminine, or neuter? Um, all of those factors kind of come in, and that's what those codes are. Take Greek with me, and I'll be happy to teach you how, how to understand that. So that's the classic interlinear. Uh, Bill Mounts, who is the author of one of our of some of our Greek textbooks that we use in those classes, has created what is called the reverse interlinear. And the reverse interlinear has the English text, and then underneath each of those English words, it rearranged the Greek words to kind of match that so that someone who doesn't know Greek at all can start there. And that's a, a really good resource. So that's available on BibleGateway.com. So you can, you can access it there if you're interested in that. So that's a, the first tool to use. Angie? Yeah, these also, I, I have in my office a Hebrew interlinear. Um, I have not ever seen anybody create a Hebrew reverse interlinear, but there are Hebrew interlinears that, that we have. I'm pretty sure we have them in our library. I have one in my office. I'd be shocked if we don't have one in our library. I think we do. Um, I just never check it out because I use my own. Okay, second factor of choosing a Bible translation today is the factor of reliable textual criticism. This is not a factor that a lot of people get excited about, and when most people ask you, what Bible translation should I use today, they probably don't, aren't thinking in terms of textual criticism. So uh, when it comes to textual criticism, we're looking at issues of are we dealing with a primary translation or a secondary translation? A secondary translation, which is a point that we made in the first factor, uh, is going to really have lots of questions regarding the textual criticism. But if we're dealing with a primary text where this English translation came from original Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, then uh, we need to ask about what was the textual criticism underneath it. And there are two basic options. There is the eclectic text. The eclectic text is, it means that textual critics have analyzed all of the available manuscripts, like just for the New Testament, 5,800 and more manuscripts. Did they factor all of those in and did they weigh them, understanding that the older ones have more value, understanding that some manuscripts have habits of more variance and some that makes them less reliable. Some manuscripts have fewer variants that makes them more reliable. And just like a few weeks ago when we were talking about the principles of textual criticism, that's the product of the eclectic text. There are other translations that are based on what would be called majority text. And this is typically King James, uh, New King James, the King James 2, other versions like that, the majority text, rather than weighing all of the manuscripts, it really weighs the manuscripts that were used primarily behind the, the King James, what made it into what we call the Textus Receptus. And it is true of the 5,800 manuscripts that we have out there, there are more of them that match that kind of, of manuscript style. They have those types of variants. And that's why you'll see the differences where a King James Bible will have a footnote that says this verse isn't in the earliest manuscripts um, or, or even in even a newer translation that might have a verse missing or it'll say a verse, but then in brackets up in the text, it'll have a verse in brackets. Then you have to look down below to see the earliest manuscripts don't have this verse. And it's not that those translations are taking out verses, it's that, it's that there are other manuscripts that were adding verses in where they didn't really belong, and that's really common with the majority text. So big picture, we want the, the better translation is going to be one that accounts for all of the possible manuscripts, uses them to create a, an eclectic text that, that we are certain that it has the New Testament to uh, accurately 
to 99.99%. That's not an exaggeration. Like it's, it's, that, it's that accurate in terms of how certain we are that what we have to, today is, is what the original authors wrote in their own first manuscripts, first autographs. Okay, after we look at reliable textual criticism, a third factor comes into translation philosophy. And this is what a lot of people are thinking of when they ask the question, what Bible translation should I use today? Translation philosophy. And translation philosophy exists on a spectrum. And at one end of the spectrum is verbal equivalence, like a word-for-word, -word, uh, more word-for-word -word style. And then the next step would be a blended style, the hybrid. The step after that would be what we call dynamic equivalence in philosophy. And that just reminds us that languages are not codes. So one word does not equal another word necessarily. And then finally, at the far end, a, a paraphrase. So to walk through some of these, uh, these differences, uh, the verbal equivalence on the left end of the spectrum, I, I prefer that we do not call this a literal Bible translation. You will hear people say, is it a literal Bible translation? And we've already looked at examples of what happens when we translate it literally. We looked a few weeks ago in class and talked about how the King James literally translates a Hebrew phrase, pisseth against the wall. And, and other phrases about the nose of God growing long. And literally, that's what it is saying, but those are Hebrew idioms to speak of every grown man and another Hebrew idiom to, be, to speak of the, the patience of God, that God is, is patient. He has a, a long nose or wide nose or a wide nose. So I don't think that it's good and useful to call these a literal translation because they're, they're not literal. Like, what is the literal definition of the word run? I, I don't know if you know this, but in the Webster Dictionary, the word run has more possible definitions than any other word. More possible definitions than any other word. It's got dozens of definitions of run. I mean, we can just throw out a couple of them, like to, to move your feet really fast, right? That's to run. But then to install a program and run it, or what happens in a lady's pantyhose when there's a tear and it, and it goes up, you've got a, a run. There are just three right there, but, and those are three vastly different definitions of one single word run, which is just your daily reminder that English is a very horrible language to learn when you're learning it as a second language. So um, which one of those definitions is the literal definition? They're all literal definitions. So, so that's why asking, I want a literal translation, isn't a useful question. Even though you feel like you're asking a good question, it's not a useful question. It's the wrong kind of question. Your, your question is really, what is the philosophy of translation? That's your real question. And, we're, and some of them lean more toward verbal equivalent philosophy, which is a little bit more word for word style. Um, so an example of that word for word, there's a Greek word, sarx. That means flesh. However, just like run in English, flesh has multiple meanings. Sometimes flesh means meat. <laughs> but other times, Paul talks about the deeds of the flesh as opposed to the fruit of the spirit in Galatians. And the deeds of the flesh are a list of, of sins. Now, does having meat make you sinful? No, that's a totally different kind of, of use of the word flesh. So the NIV made a decision that when they came across flesh and it was being used in a figurative way, they translated it not as flesh, but as sinful nature. So that is more of a hybrid under uh, philosophy. But a word-for-word -word verbal equivalence philosophy will translate sarks as flesh just about every time. The, the pro of that is that you know when, you're read, when you read flesh in English that it's the same word that Paul used in this chapter and the same word that Paul used in that chapter. And when you see flesh and sinful nature and you don't do your homework, you won't know that, oh, that was actually the same word. Um, that happens a lot as you go through Romans. The word for law sometimes is translated as law, sometimes translated as principle. Is it referring back to what Moses gave, or is it referring back to just a general rule for life? 
because the word can have different meanings in different contexts. So a verbal equivalence will try to use the same word across multiple contexts. The upside of that is you see the consistency of the language behind it. The downside of that is it can lead to some, some, some meanings that are, are misleading to think that deeds of the flesh involve, it's because I have meat that I have these deeds of the flesh. That's, that's not what it's talking about. So those are the pros and then those are the cons. Words have a, a wide range. In fact, let me, let me just explain it this way. We don't want to call it literal. It's more word for word. The pro is that it is consistent word use to make it easier for word studies. The con is that it can be pretty weak English and that words have different meanings in different contexts. Moving to the next step of that spectrum is the hybrid, um, the hybrid philosophy. So hybrid um, is a blend between the verbal equivalence and the dynamic equivalence. Um, it is, let's see. And, and really, I can't explain the hybrid until I explain the dynamic equivalent. So let's move on to the dynamic, and then we'll come back and talk more about the hybrid. The dynamic equivalence is more of a thought-for-thought -thought translation philosophy rather than word-for-word. -word. It has ideas for ideas, phrases for phrases. Words can be rearranged, and it reminds us that languages are not codes, so that every time that you see sarks, that you just should translate it as flesh. Instead, we understand that in some contexts, sarks means meat. In other contexts, sarks does mean sinful nature, depending on the point and the context of what the author is talking about. So it means understanding the idioms and the thoughts of the original language and expressing those as closely as we can to how we would say it today. So some examples of this would be the NLT, the um, the New Century Version, the New American Bible, the Good News Bible, the Today's English Version, or the, um, the CEV um, as well. Those are examples of the dynamic equivalence. The hybrid that is back in the middle between these two is a combination of verbal equivalence and dynamic equivalence. And depending on the text, it might lean more toward one philosophy or the other philosophy depending on the nature of the text, the genre of the book, the author uh, from one author to another, um, and, and just the context of what's going on. So examples of that hybrid philosophy would be the Common English Bible, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the NIV, and the New Jerusalem Bible. Back to this one um, on that verbal equivalence. Examples of verbal equivalence would be more toward the ESV, uh, the King James, the New American Standard, New King James, and NRSV. Those are all more examples of that verbal equivalence philosophy of translation. So those are the, the spectrums there, just helping you go back and, and get those notes on the pros and cons. Um, so that takes us from verbal equivalence. We've gone through hybrid dynamic equivalence. Let's talk a little bit about paraphrases. A paraphrase expresses thoughts in contemporary idioms, even if that idiom might be a little bit anachronistic. Uh, anachronistic means outside of time. So many will need to, uh, so we'll use, we'll use phrases. One of my favorite examples of this, if you, you know John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among, her, among us in the NIV. That's what I memorized. The, the Greek there actually uses a verb that means to pitch a tent. So the King James translation says the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. That's not a word that we would ever use, but you can know, you know that the tabernacle is a tent and it made it turned tabernacle into a verb, which is kind of what the Greek did. It pitched his tent among us. But I like what the message does. And the message is a bit more of a paraphrase, although Eugene Peterson is a great scholar who did go back to the Greek and Hebrew, but he puts it more in contemporary idiom. And so John 1.14 of the message said, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And when you, when you chuckle and laugh and you, 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 you grin when I say moved into the neighborhood, you, you get it. And so in that little moment, that little reaction that you had, like, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's new. I haven't heard that before. I like that. That resonates. Well, that little light bulb that just came on shows that you are understanding the actual meaning. 
And if you're understanding the actual meaning, that's what a good translation is. So many times the, the, these more idea for idea, the more dynamic translations can be better translations if they put the idea in your head that is closer to the idea that was in the author's head and the original audience's heads. So to look at the big picture, here's a big example of this. Uh, from 1 Peter 1.13, you can see the Greek at the top. I'm not going to read that for you, but our, our Greek three students got to do this on a test recently. Um, then there's the uh, New American Standard Bible. Um, I'm actually going to go to the bottom first. King James. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, just to unpack that, if you read, gird up the loins of your mind, does your mind have loins? And what does it mean to gird them? Let's, let's find out as we read the New American Standard. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. That little um, italics right there, it shows that those words were added and that they are not in the Greek that is up above. And I, you can see the Greek and that little, the word spirit, it would be pneumati, it, it's not up there. So it, if it were there, it would be pneumati, but it's not up there. So the, uh, the NASB feels like it needed to add that to explain what it means to be sober, to be sober in the, in the sphere of your spirit. Okay, then fix your hopes completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, you're understanding a little bit more of what it means. Moving into the ESV. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, be sober-minded. It doesn't say in spirit, it says sober-minded. Set your hopes fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Moving into the NIV. Therefore, with minds that are fully alert, that are alert and fully sober. With minds that are fully alert and uh, that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. The New Living Translation (NLT) says, "So prepare your minds for action and self and exercise self control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed in the world." And then the message: So roll up your sleeves. Put your mind in gear. Be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. When we look through all of these different translations, you have a better understanding of what that verse means. And this is what you did in your uh, translation comparison assignment. So um, the question for you guys is, what did you notice? Some You all read uh, a book of the New Testament in eight different translations. Where did you notice, oh yeah, I can tell a difference between a translation philosophy between one translation and another, just observations that you guys had. Yeah, Trent. I reckon you shared this with you, but in the one section in First John, it was this first John 3.20, and it talks about how if you don't, um, if you don't love your brother, then you're not, you're not a believer, and most of the other parts said, other translations said, if you don't, if you close your heart to your brother, you're not, uh, you cannot be with Christ. Mm. But then the KJV says, uh, <laughs> he that shut up his bowels to his brother, he cannot, he does not love him. Uh -huh. And it was really interesting to look at the, the NASB, and it, the NASB says, close your heart, but it's a little. Inward parts. Inward parts, yeah. So, so the key. Uh, like, <laughs> yeah. To repeat this just for the for the for the video, yeah. The King James in the first John says, Don't close up your bowels to your brother. Whereas the, the more modern translations say, Don't close your heart. Um and and yeah, so the, there's a Greek word behind that that means inward parts. And in 1611, when King James is written, inward parts meant bowels, and that was all your parts. But uh, for us, it 
primarily focuses on the colon, which is not a way like, I, you know, if you want to love me, I would appreciate if you keep your colon shut <laughs> while you're around me. That's kind of how, how, I, would in, how I would interpret that passage. Like that's, that's how I, that's my love language. <laughs> Very good example. All right. Uh, any other fun examples? <laughs> yeah, Evan? So I, I was looking at section headings, actually. Okay. That was really funny because the set the translations that did have them, a lot of them said uh, something along the lines of like suffering for Christ or suffering with Christ. And the message said glory just around the corner. Oh. It was like very like painting in a very positive light. Uh huh. <laughs> Yeah. So even in the section headings, you can see now the section headings obviously aren't original or inspired, but they are a feature of the translation. And that's a good observation. Yeah. 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 Colby. So can I go up to anything? I just picked an awful one that I saw from the disciples. Because like the disciples, something, uh, oh, something that they were translation. Okay. Lots of headings. Wow. Wow. Headings every couple of verses. That's a lot of commentary. And that's that's definitely influencing the way that you're interpreting what you're reading yep. <laughs> with that many headings. Yeah. The two that were most like odd for me, I had Dewey readings. Uh, I did first slides, so Dewey readings, and then uh, the passion translation. Mm. And they were like way out of left field. They had a lot of different spots. Like the Dewey readings were just cut out verses. I mean, there's no meaning there. Yeah. Um, and then the passion translation. Anytime there was some kind of uh, first Thessalonians talks a lot about falling asleep, you know, those are falling asleep. Uh-huh. Um, and it completely cut out all the analogy. And every time falling asleep showed up, they would talk about death. They just would completely never used fall asleep as a metaphor. They interpreted the metaphor. Yeah. And spoke of death every time in First Thessalonians. That was in the Passion yeah. translation. And then the Douay Reims is missing lots of pieces. That would be a good example of what we were talking about earlier in terms of the, the source, because Douay Reims was translated not from the Greek in First Thessalonians, it was translated from the Latin Vulgate. That's why it's missing those verses. That's why it's missing those verses. Yeah. Yeah. Great observations. So in your notes, you can see a, this, this table here, pretty good one that helps us to understand the, um, the spectrum of Bible translation philosophy. The word hybrid doesn't appear on the diagram, but it's, it's the idea right there in between word for word and thought for thought. So that's, that's what we're looking at with types of Bible translations and their philosophy. Moving on to the next factor. The next factor is the originality factor. The originality factor actually, actually is affected by copyright law. And this is a problem that for, for a lot of translators, um, when I open up certain passages of, of scripture and read them in the Greek, there are some ways that are just more natural to say them. And then like, well, you could say them in other ways instead, but it's less natural. You're actually kind of like making, creating obstacles to go to say, to render something into English in a way that is, that hasn't already been rendered, hasn't already been said or translated in that way. So a little example of this is from, uh, this is 2 Timothy 3, 16. Um, and you know, the NIV, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Over in the Greek on the left, the word for God breathed is thea pneustos. That's a Greek compound word. Thea means God. Pneustos literally means breathed. We get our word pneumatic, like a pneumatic tool. So it's, it's air powered from God. And it takes us back to when God spoke creation into existence. And when God breathed life into the nostrils of Adam in Genesis. That's that kind of idea. So in the King James, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. In the ESV, all scripture is breathed out by God. In IV, all scripture is God breathed. And then in the NLT, all scripture is inspired by God. And um, I have heard before Bill Mounts, who I've mentioned already a couple of times in this lesson, 
He was on the translation committee of the NIV and on the translation committee of the ESV. And I have heard him say that they got to this verse and they weren't allowed to use the NIV wording. Copyright. They had to use the ES, they had to create a new wording. And that's why the ESV really, I think, has the most awkward and clunky phrasing of all. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's not wrong. It's not false, but it's clunky. And it's not as, as smooth, it's not as poetic as some of the other translation options out there. That is a factor that, that contributes to, um, to our reading. Finally, we get to the last factor that is use. And my recommendation for use is that you want to use a variety of translations for a variety of purposes. So as you were reading, you noticed, maybe you noticed, you know, this translation would be really good devotionally, or this other translation is one that I would like to preach out of, but man, I do not want to preach out of that other one. Um, this would be good for, for teaching if I'm going to go like in an in-depth verse-by-verse Bible study, or if I'm teaching children and kids, I want to use this, this translation, not that one. Um, so what did you observe as you did your... Um, your translation comparison assignment, what translation, when you see like different kinds of uses, you're like, oh yeah, I would use this translation for that, but I would not use that translation for this. What kind of came to your mind as examples? Yeah, Michael. I picked up the Adventure Bible as a joke. Okay. Um, it's <laughs> based off of the New International Reader's Version, the, the third grade reading level. The Adventure Bible, New International Reader's Version, third grade reading level. Yeah. Um, but it actually does a really good job of explaining the scripture really simply yeah. in a way that kids and youth can understand, especially uh, people that have a harder time reading. Yeah. Um, without sacrificing what the scripture is actually saying. Yeah. That's so, really um, hard. Yeah. And they did a really good job with it. All right. So you, you picked it up kind of as a joke, but you were actually very, came away very impressed with it. Yeah. Um, an example of that, that NIV R or the R NIV, some uh, NIRV, there it is, New International Reader Version um, on a third grade reading level. So not only is that great for kids, but in a church where I served in Kansas for several years, we had a Sunday school class of international college students that were from Korea and Japan and Saudi Arabia and Sweden and China and Brazil, just from all over the world that are in this college uh, class. And every one of them is speaking English as a second language. And that was the Bible that we used for that class so that everyone on, could, could understand it on a, on a very low level reading level to help them because English wasn't their natural language. Jay, what did you notice? First thing is I was really impressed with all the eight different versions that I looked at how good they all were. Okay. And they all, while there were some differences in words and phrasing and stuff like that, you know, you look at paragraph by paragraph, the meaning was spot on with all of them, including, you know, the message. Uh -huh. um, but the, for just devotional reading, I, I, I went back to the message. I did that last year. Uh -huh. I just, I felt it's the only one for me that encouraged me to sit and read. Mm. Even the NIV, I kind of struggled to go back and read some sentences over again. Yeah. You know, to, to really kind of into it, which is not a bad thing. But to be able to just sit and read the message, mm. it, it reaffirmed my liking of the message. Yeah. Because when I compared it against all the other versions, it had what needed to be there. Very cool. Um, I'll go to KJ. The message is valuable for devotional reading and reading without struggle. When you just want to take it up and read and you don't want to get slowed down by some things that are more complicated, there's value to that. That that's a good value, Trent. 
I'm not a message reader, but yes. when I so the message is filled with the whole thing is American Indian. Yes. Yeah, so like Jesus moving to the neighborhood. Uh huh. No one would say that's in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, yeah, Jesus moved. That's so the idioms of the of the message are not the idioms of other English speaking people around the world. So every time I read it, I just think of like some white American person and like it doesn't just connect mm. as as other one. So I really enjoy the NLP. It was people would like explain it in simple uh -huh. clear English without using the idioms of American. That's a great observation. Angie. Yeah. Um, I also think in the um where in that Right. So they use kind of like make sure they're learning in a way that everyone yeah. can hear. No matter what country you're from. Yeah. Yeah. The I of the NIV. Yeah. <laughs> I, never, I never knew that. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. The eye of the NIV is that that translation committee had people from around the world, English speakers from around the world. Um, and they chose words that that no matter if you're in England or America or Australia or Zimbabwe, uh, you you understand it's not it's not a colloquial phrase that only works for one nation, whereas that's very, very true of of the message translation. Good observations. Yeah. Tweeting. I, I got that MEV. MEV. OK. It's one of the main translations of the church uses. Mm -hmm. And what I found it to be really good for is reading on either a devotional level mm -hmm. or a level that, like, maybe you're about to teach. Yeah. You just want to, like, get another translation in mm -hmm. that's built towards your context and still faithful to what the original text said. Very cool. Very cool. So to explain my my metaphor here with the golf clubs, why do I have the golf clubs on the screen? The idea there is that when someone says, what's the best translation? Um, my first response to them is usually back to say, what's the best golf club? And you don't play a round of golf with just one club. You need different clubs for different purposes. So sometimes you want to hit it far. Sometimes you want to chip it out of the sand. Sometimes you need a putt. And, and those different purposes um, are accomplished through different clubs. And in the same way, a translation, if what is your purpose? Is your purpose to share the gospel with ch children or, or speakers of English as a second language or for an international audience, or maybe for just um, a, a, an American that wants to read um, quickly and easily without too much stress at the coffee shop? And those are all valuable purposes that need to be accomplished. And we need different translations to, to do all of that. So uh, they can all be good translations. There's a lot of good, reliable translations um, for that reason. But there are some that are out there that are uh, suspicious that we should probably um, avoid or put a big warning label on. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, again, another diagram that has a translation comparison chart. This is uh, similar, and it has even more than the previous diagram. <coughs> but again, you can see the differences between formal equivalents, more word for word on the left, functional equivalents, meaning for meaning on the right, and the intermediate, which I was calling a hybrid earlier in the middle. Um, one that I haven't heard anybody mention yet that I just want to throw a shout out to that I read cover to cover um, a year ago was the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Um, I want to just throw some, some props to that one. I read that one cover to cover, and I was very pleasantly surprised by the, uh, the, the scholarship the read, and the readability. I thought it had a very good balance of, of I, I understand the Greek that is behind a lot of the text, so I understand, like, oh, that's a good way of saying that. And then at the same time, but that's also a way that I could read that to my kids and they would understand what that means. So I, I was impressed by that one. It's it's in my top three. I, I really am still, I know the NIV gets a lot of criticism, but because of what Angie said, that it's a, 
uh, really an international translation. There's a lot of value to that. There are some weaknesses at times, it's not, and no translation is perfect in the same way that, that no golf club is perfect. So every golf club will have a limitation. Every translation will have a limitation, and which is why we need to make sure that the interlinear is in our tool bag, our golf club bag of translations. Okay, so another factor continuing on, who are the translators? And do they keep their identity secret? An example of this is the New World Translation, um, that, which is the translation of the Bible by Jehovah's Witnesses. Truthfully, it's not even a translation. They did not go back to the Greek or the Hebrew. Um, what they did is they basically worked off of the King James and they rephrased it to the way that they wanted and they added words or they misrepresented certain verses to support their false doctrines, mostly Arianism, the idea that Jesus is a created being. They, they pretended to be humble and say, oh, we're far too humble to, uh, to put our names on this translation. They also didn't want to be exposed because if they put their names on that translation, we would know the, the reality that none of them were qualified. Um, not long, a few years after the New World Translation came out, um, someone, a, a nephew of one of the presidents of the Jehovah's Witnesses left the Jehovah's Witnesses church and publicly made it known who the six men were involved in that translation. And of those six, zero had studied Hebrew. Of the six, one had studied Greek, but it was classical Greek, not Koine Greek of the New Testament, which is why their, their Bible never says cross. It says torture stake. Now, torture stake is an accurate rendering of the word stauros from about three to 400 BC, which is the classical Greek era. But during the first century AD, that word had evolved its meaning. So that cross meant what we understand as cross, not just simply a torture stake. And there's many more examples of that within that. That's a, 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 a bad translation because it's not even a real translation. So what are the qualifications of the translators? Um, one, are they international? Is it just one guy? Is it a team of, of scholars? Um, is it just a handful of guys who are not qualified? All of those are factors that we want to consider. Another factor to consider is the target reading level. We've mentioned this quite a bit about the uh, NIRV being a, uh, a third grade reading level. On the far left of this, the NCV um, the Message Bible is a four, fourth to fifth grade reading level, uh, God's Word translation in fifth grade. In LT, that several of you mentioned that you liked, was sixth grade. Um, NKJV, the Christian Standard Bible, uh, Common English Bible in the seventh grade. NIV is seventh to eighth. ESV is tenth. Eleventh grade is New American Standard. And um, the twelfth grade is the King James and the RSV. So, Understanding the reading level makes a big difference too. Connor, what was your question? I was just wondering what your opinion is on the Cotton Patch Bible. Yeah, so the Cotton Patch Bible is another example of a paraphrase. It is only of the New Testament. I'm not even sure if it is the entire New Testament. I know it's the majority of the New Testament. The Cotton Patch Bible is written for Southern rednecks. So examples of the Cotton Patch Bible, they don't call him Peter, son of Jonah, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon Peter Bar-Jonah. They call him Rocky Johnson. And they even change the geography so that it's not, the Bible didn't happen near Jerusalem. It happened in Atlanta. Jesus is crucified in Atlanta. Um, and it uses Southern idioms. It uses Southern idioms. So obviously the cotton patch is not something that you would use for, for scholarship at all. It is a very, very niche target. But if you need to share the gospel with, with good old boy rednecks that live in that region of the country, and I've spent a little bit of time in that region of the country, um, it is a good way of getting, of opening their eyes to the truth that, that scripture says, and it helps them to understand it's for me too. But the reality is that 99% of the world in human history 
is not going to find that to be very useful. I mean, you talk about the message sounds like it's for white people. <laughs> the cotton patch uh, translation um, is, is very, very niche. But my favorite rendering of the cotton patch Bible, uh, I have to mention, is from, uh, from Romans 6, um, which you know as should we go on sinning so that grace may increase by no means. And the Greek word behind that is an optative meganoita, which is the strongest way that you can say, heaven forbid, let it never be. And so the cotton patch in that verse says something like, should we go right on sinning to get right on more grace? Hell no. <laughs> and, and as a result, for that target audience, that's actually a fairly faithful expression of what Paul has in mind. <laughs> When he's trying to say, no, the grace of Jesus doesn't mean you get to keep on sinning. That's what he's trying to say. So that, that's my, my two cents on the cotton patch. Um, yeah. And, and then in the same vein, uh, there's someone out there that's trying to create like the Gen Z Bible. And I've seen some other ones, um, like some really weird niche uh, Bibles that are out there. There is someone, again, Speaking of, of people that have too much time on their hands, and I, I don't, I don't think that this is very useful for the kingdom. But there's someone that's translating the Bible into Klingon. In case I, it's, I know it's Star Trek, I don't even know the race of the aliens that speak Klingon. They're called Klingon. Okay, that makes sense. So, in case they ever decide to exist in reality, and we need to evangelize them, we'll be prepared. But otherwise, it's really not a good use of time. Yeah, there's another translation that's Pretty heretical with uh, the Lolcats. Lolcats Bible. Yeah, that's horrendous. But it's, if you want a good chuckle and yeah. you know, question your salvation, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's just more. It's 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 really satire yes. at best, mockery at worst. Yeah. Um, another factor to consider here is theological presuppositions and agendas. What are theological leanings? And Issues that certain translations will deliberately choose certain wordings because of a, a, a theological leaning. And we talked about this in the last class, where before the King James was written, there were some people in England who were using the Geneva Bible. But many people did not like the Geneva Bible because it was translated um, with a lot of influence uh, from Calvin and Luther, and there is a lot of Calvinist kind of doctrines that are in the Geneva Bible. It, when there's a verse that could be interpreted in a more Calvinistic way or, or in a less Calvinistic way, the Geneva Bible is always going to go in the, in the way that is more of the Calvinistic kind of understanding. So that's an example of that. Another example of, of eschatology. This is one of my, uh, my criticisms of the NIV. There is a word in the book of Revelation, Greek word flipsis. It means suffering. But in the NIV, when the NIV translators think in their interpretation of the book of Revelation that we're talking about suffering in the present of John, we'll translate flipsis as suffering. But when the NIV translators think that, oh, this is clearly sometime way into the future and has nothing to do with John or his original audience. They don't translate it as suffering, they translate it as tribulation. But it's the same word. What if in those other texts that are, that are translated as tribulation, John has in mind exactly what he means when he says that he is currently a partner in their suffering, in their thlipsis, and at the end of chapter one. And that's, a, that's an eschatological um, theological, theological um, interpretation. And, and because of their theology and their, their eschatology, they are interpreting and translating the Bible in that kind of way. Other things regarding like sexual ethics or denominational distinctives, um, denominational distinctives, choosing to translate uh, presbyteros as, or episkopos as elder or bishop. That's, a, that's, that, that's going to be more common in an Anglican or in a Catholic uh, translation. 
Um, other issues like that that are, that are denominational distinctives that you'll see. And so be aware of those, which is again why I think the strongest translations are made up of a international team that helps to level that out and really helps it to be a, a much more reliable translation and, and, and weeds out a lot of the, uh, the niche um, readings. An eclectic team is also less likely to be over-influenced by a theological agenda. Then we get to personal factors, and we can talk about digital or print Bibles. So let's talk about apps for just a moment. You, this, uh, this part of the lecture always becomes outdated really, really quickly. So it won't surprise me if in the near future some of these apps fail to exist, or if in the near future new apps are introduced that surpass many of these. But we have available today some great ones uh, like the version app. Um, hundreds of Bible uh, versions and translations. It has reading plans, dozens of languages. You can add your own highlights to it. You can bookmark it. The Bible.is app, um, again, lots of languages. It really has more languages and translations than any other. It has some dramatized Bible audio. The Jesus Film Project can be accessed from within that app, so you can read and listen to the Bible at the same time. The ESV Crossway app, published uh, by the Cross, Crossway is the publisher of the ESV. It only has the ESV text, but it also has free audio if you want to listen to it in the, in the ESV. Other popular apps, the Glow Bible app. Um, it has some built-in videos, images, maps, study tools, lots of translations. Blue Letter Bible has over 30 translations that are free for download. The NIV Bible app uh, has won awards for top design and functionality. The Olive Tree Bible Study is uh, designed for deeper Bible study and has thousands of extra resources, including commentaries, maps, and Bible dictionaries. The Daily Bible app has daily Bible verses, daily Bible reading plans, and supports several different Bible translations. Uh, Bible Gateway has 90 translations, and it also includes interlinears. And the one that I use is the Logos Bible app. Um, and um, what I like about that, it's, it's not cheap. It, it came with software that I put on my computer, but it is its own app. And then I can download that app and sync it with the software that I have on my computer. And um, I can just do a quick swipe and swipe through different translations. So um, that's, that's what I'm using usually if you see me on my phone during a chapel sermon is I'm reading through the, the Logos uh, app and I can see the Greek and the English. There's even functions there where I can hold my finger down on a Greek word if I don't know it and it'll pop up the, uh, the definition uh, in Hebrew as well. So I find that really, really useful. But again, it's not cheap. Next factor, personal factors like life application. These have quite a few pros, but they also have quite a few cons. The pros for personal factors are that it will aid the reader in personal discipleship and application. And there are many people who think the Bible's not for me. It's just for those people. Maybe it's just for white Americans, but it's not for me. Or maybe it's just for um, North Americans, but not South America, whatever, whatever it is that you can have um, a life application Bible that is a good reminder the Bible is for you too. So this top picture here, the original African Heritage Study Bible, the first time I encountered it was um, at the Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was in the gift shop there. And as a 19-year-old, I picked it up, and I was immediately offended because I looked through, and it had pictures of Bible characters, like a whole page would be dedicated to a, a, a face portrait of Bible characters, and every one of them were Black, African-American. And like Ezekiel had a grill, and Elijah had dreadlocks. And, and like they, they were mirroring the fashions of, of African-Americans. And as a 19-year-old from Kansas, who was a freshman in Bible college, because I knew everything at that moment, I was deeply offended. I've gotten over that. Because 
that it does have value because there are many people, and, and I can remember the first Bible that I had when I was a kid, tiny little King James New Testament with the Psalms and Proverbs, and it had pictures in it. And guess what every character was in those pictures? They were all white. And, and as, I, as I thought more about it, I realized you know, that was given to me. And at that time, it, I, the people that I was seeing in the Bible looked like me, and I knew that this is for me. And I realized that there's a lot of value to a Bible like that, the African Heritage Bible, so that everyone understands that this is for me too. And, and is it historically accurate? No, it's not. Was my little Bible with, with the white people in it historically accurate? No, it was not. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's the strength as well as the weakness <clears throat> of these. So I, I do appreciate them in, in those kinds of ways. Um, then other ones beyond, beyond ones that are more race targeted, you can also see out there for sale, there are uh, devotionals for men, for women, for teens, for children. I've seen them for like the police officer's Bible or the fireman's Bible or the stay-at-home mom's Bible, et cetera. And so there's value for that because it helps us to know that, that there are passages that really apply to my life. There's a lot of value to that. The cons are also need to be factored in. That the Bible is not all about me. And that that not everybody in the Bible looks like me. We just need to understand that reality. There's room for saying it's for me, but it's not about me. And my way of interpreting the Bible or my way of applying the Bible is not just about me. So an example that I, that I like to use, it works really well, is from Ephesians where it says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, what does that mean? The, the universal significance of that principle, love your wife sacrificially. Does that apply to every single culture? Yes. But the application study notes, it's going to be different in your men's devotional Bible because it's going to give men some practical advice on how they can love their wives. And, and that chapter will probably have something else valuable to say in the women's devotional Bible, helping them to understand how that applies to them and then, and then other people as well. So those are just little examples of, of why we understand the value, but also the limitations of these personal factors that are added there. Other personal factors would be the size of print. And we don't, normally don't think about that, but that is a big factor for a lot of people that, that if, if you can't read it, if you're, yeah, if you need, if you need glasses or if you want to make it easy to read, you want to give yourself a headache so you can read it for a while, get yourself one in big print. And, and I, I would actually encourage you to do that sooner than later, because <laughs> the day will come <laughs> when, when you need some thick glasses and, um, and you just want to be able to, to, to read fast without having to strain and, and getting tired of reading. Other study Bibles, there are a long list of study Bibles, but to tell you some of my favorites on the list of study Bibles, um, the NIV study Bible is pretty good. It has um, commentary notes below and it has introductions to each book that are really valuable. There is an ESV study Bible, and there's, I'm sure that there's more than one, but one of the ESV study Bibles that I've seen um, that had, that was ESV translation, and it was systematic theology. It incorporated systematic theology in different inserts and study notes and, and uh, little offsets to the side or footnotes. And, and again, whenever you have a study Bible like that, that is especially a systematic study Bible, um, the theological agenda of the publishing house has a lot to do with the theology of that. So that particular one by, made by Crossway is uh, pretty representative of Reformed theology. And I don't agree with all the tenets of Reformed theology. Um, the key word study Bible, that was, that was one that I was given as a teenager. Um, not long before I graduated high school, and it made me interested in learning Greek and Hebrew. And it had number of words, and I could look up and see a word study on that word because of the keyword study Bible. It was very valuable. The archaeology study Bible is pretty cool. Um, every time that, not every time, many times 
when there is a location or an event that happens and there exists archaeological evidence today, it will point that out. I was extremely disappointed with how little there is in Ephesus. I've been to Ephesus and it there's like, like the Temple of Artemis. Um, now today it's basically just one pillar left in a swamp because the British Museum has the rest of it. But um, there's also like, like the theater where in Acts 19, they were shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. I've been there, I've stood in that theater. That's some amazing archaeology, and it wasn't in the archaeology study Bible. So that's when I kind of caught myself, and again, and I said most or many of the sites, not all. I think that it, 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 there's room for improvement on that one. Um, moving into other supplements that are useful for your Bible and uh, under the heading of personal factors. A Bible with good maps, maps of the tribes of Israel, maps of Paul's journeys, maps of the ministry of Jesus. All of those are great to help us understand that these events happen to real people in real places on this earth that you can visit today. Um, weights and measures, how much is a shekel? Um, how long is a furlong? What's a cubit? How much is a lepton or a denarius? All of those uh, are, are valuable for uh, getting some translations there. Um, timelines, again, just a useful um, study guide as well. Concordances and indices, um, a concordance, so it will tell you, usually a concordance at the end of the Bible will not be an exhaustive concordance, because an exhaustive concordance is, is a big, thick book, but they'll have a abridged concordance of some kind of key words and key uses of that word, but usually not, definitely not every word and definitely not every use. Um, application points, again, back to those applicational Bibles, and then introductory material for each book. I find that to be very, very useful. But again, keep in mind that's not inspired, and there could be errors, and there might be other interpretations of, of that. Um, different people have different opinions on when Daniel should be dated or the dating of, of Obadiah or something like that. Um, so you might, you might don't just rely on one source for that. And then another personal factor is red letters. I know some people that really, really like red letters. Um, most Bible teachers really don't like red letters. Like, why not? Those are the words of Jesus. Well, are they? <laughs> um, because, because what you're dealing with is in the, in the reality, even the words of Jesus are communicated through under inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the inspired authors. And, and a, a negative default of the red letters is you get some people that would say, well, I'm a red letter Christian. And they want to elevate and say the words of Jesus are really where I build, build my faith and all that rest of that stuff. I don't have to obey that. And you create a canon within the canon that is not an appropriate thing to do. So that's where red letters have, have some fault. But interesting little tidbit about that, the red lettering is not a new innovation. Red lettering has existed before the printing press. Back when, hand, when manuscripts were written by hand, there were scribes that were doing red lettering even back then. All right, that's kind of cool. Um, and then person, per, another personal factor, the idea of gender inclusive language. So a verse that we're all familiar with in the ESV, let anyone who would come after me, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. The 2011 NIV it has more inclusive, gender inclusive language. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Advantages and disadvantages of this. Um, let's talk the advantage. Why would the NIV say, let in, them deny themselves, take up their cross? It is popular today to use plural pronouns as a gender inclusive singular. So that if someone were to read the ESV, a female were to read the ESV and think, oh, that's just for him. Does that mean she doesn't have to take up her cross to follow Jesus? And, and that's not what it means. So the them makes it more inclusive. However, it creates a, a new problem. How many people per cross? 
oh, good thing I don't have to take up my cross by myself. You can carry the cross with me because it's them taking up their crosses. You know, I don't have to take my whole church. My whole church bears, bears a cross. So I don't really need to worry about taking it up myself. That's what the church is there to do. You see the problems that can create? Now, the reality is that this is just a reflection of the evolution of the English language, which is a language that has always been evolving. Um, and there's, there's no single point where you can pinpoint and say, this is when the English language was completely correct on that day. It, it's always been evolving. So we need to acknowledge that. But if you go back to the, the Greek, I highlighted those two pronouns. That word himself, it's singular. And the word his cross, autu, it's singular. But in the Greek, even though it is a masculine pronoun that could be translated as his, it is understood in the context that it does not exclude women. That's called a generic use of grammatical gender. And it's different from grammatical gender, different from natural gender. So there's two solutions. One solution is to change it to plurals and then re-educate people to know that, no, this is actually a singular, even though it's a plural. Or the other one is leave it singular, but masculine and educate people to know that it doesn't exclude women. Either way you go, there's a, there's a weakness. And either way you go, you're going to have to educate people further. Um, I don't think so. Anyway, I would rather educate people <laughs> the first time than, in, than introduce another problem. Uh, all right, then big picture, one last final big chart for translations. And, and again, I'm just throwing out different ones because I found all of these different charts to be useful, and I hope that you find them useful too. So that's uh, the entirety of one of your pages of, of your handout. To wrap up, let's talk for a moment about Bible use and availability today. We've talked about Bible translations, and all, all today we focus on the on the the. English translations of the Bible, but it is not just our language that the Bible needs to be translated into. There's lots of other languages that we need to translate the Bible into as well. Um, this is already a bit dated. It's 10 years old, but as of 10 years ago, this was a survey that was done by the National Association of Evangelicals that created this pie chart to show what translations are most used by evangelical Christians today. And again, I think that this is focused in America. Um, but you can see the NIV being most popular, the NASB, ASB, the ESV being third, New King James fourth, New Living Translation fifth, and then some other ones beyond that. Um, Ten years later, I would imagine that the ESV has a much larger piece of the pie. Um, and I would imagine that the NIV piece of the pie is a bit smaller. And I think that the Christian Standard Bible, or also the Holman Christian Standard Bible, is, is starting to creep up because it's very quality, and I, I would recommend it. I think it deserves to, to creep up on the list. Um, but one thing that encourages me about this is that that's a fairly eclectic um, spread of translations. You've got a hybrid. You've got something that's more word for word. Some other word for word, and by the time you have number five, it's much more idea for idea. So in the top five, you have this whole spectrum kind of kind of listed there within the, even the top five. So that's a good thing. I would recommend that if you think about your personal pie chart of the Bible translations that you use, is it eclectic? Do you have do you have something from each part of the spectrum of Bible translation philosophy? Looking at statistics of Bible translation, this comes from Wycliffe Bible Translators, and, and I gave you that secondary handout. Um, there's the, uh, the link if you want to uh, see that. That link is updated, so there's a chance in the future, if you're watching this video in the future, that that link might not be there. But hopefully you can still go to wycliffe.net slash resources and see that there are updated versions of these stats. So as of now, it's 2022, the statistics come from 2021. In the gray, those are the statistics from two years earlier, from 2019. And that, show, that helps us to see the trend of the change. So there are known to be 7,353 languages in the world, and the world population is about 7.9 billion people. Of those 
people and languages. We have 717 languages in the world that have the entire Bible in their language. Praise God for that. There's another 1,582 Bible or languages that have the New Testament plus. Usually the Psalms and the Proverbs or Genesis get added next. And in the last, in the two years, that has gone up by nearly 40, 35, 30, 34, 36. Anyway, uh, then there are another 1196 languages where there are just portions of the New Testament that are translated. And that number has gone up in the last two years um, by again, nearly 60. And then total languages with some scripture that is a total language, uh, total languages of 3,495, which accounts for 7.04 billion people in, on earth. That means that there are still not quite a billion people on earth who don't have the Bible in their heart language. And again, we're talking heart languages here. While the Bible not, might not be in their heart language, it might be in their trade language that they speak at the marketplace. But again, that makes it more likely for them to think, well, the Bible is for those people, not me, because it's not my heart language. That's why we want to translate more into more languages. So here's some more statistics about languages that have no scripture. We're talking about... Um, around 67.6 million people in 828 languages that don't have the Bible in their heart language. Of those, there are 100, there are 145 million people in 1,892 languages that have a work in progress. So that's going back to the other statistics that are out there. Um, but about what is in progress. We have 2.8 million people in 1,119 uh, languages that are not vital enough to plan translation work. We're talking people in very small, isolated people groups uh, that have access to multiple trade languages. And we would love to be able to put the Bible in their language, but we just don't have the manpower to get them all done at the moment. Give us time and manpower, and those will be reached. Hopefully, they still exist by the time we get there, though. Uh, 4.2 million people in 44 languages need translation work still yet to begin. And while we're talking about languages, just to remind ourselves that it is not languages that need the scriptures. It is the people who speak those languages who need the scripture. So that's why we're thankful for Wycliffe Bible translators. We're also thankful for pioneer Bible translators and Boise Bible College partners with them and has several graduates that are working to bring the Bible to people who don't have it in their heart language yet. We're going to end our semester right here. Uh, the big picture outline from God to us. I'm just going to step back and review what have we learned this entire semester. This entire semester, we have basically traced, and you need to know this because this is going to be on the final exam. So we have basically traced seven major steps to, for the Bible to get from God to us. It didn't just fall out of heaven, bound in leather with my name on it. It was first revealed by God, not the book of Revelation, but God's act of revealing. He reveals. He's a God who reveals. And the God who reveals then inspires the authors of Scripture. Moses and John and Matthew and Luke and Paul and Isaiah and so many others that are inspired to write down that scripture. By the power of the Spirit, we believe that God has protected his word so that it is completely true, inerrant. And actually, I'm going to give you these definitions, so I should slow down and stop giving you, I should actually speed up through this. We'll talk about canonicity, transmission, textual criticism, and translations. Now let's go back a little deeper into each of these. So this is where you can um, fill in the blanks. The revelation, again, that's that first step, the process by which God makes truth about himself known to mankind. Sometimes he does that through burning bushes. Sometimes he does that when he speaks uh, and a voice from heaven, sometimes it happens when he's incarnated and walks around and teaches. That's God's revelation. 
The second step is inspiration. Through his Holy Spirit, God enables human authors to communicate, God, to communicate God's message in such a way that the truth that he wishes to reveal is presented accurately. And we talked about inspiration. Sometimes it might mean the author writing down word for word as if it's dictation. Sometimes it might mean that God is giving them an idea and says, I need you to address this and tell them this message, but they put it in their own words. And we can see the personalities of those different authors come through. Uh, we can also see creativity as the authors choose genres that are many times poetic and, and beautiful. And I think that that is revealing the, the, the humanness of the author, but at the same time, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The third level was inerrancy, that the Bible does not affirm anything that is contrary to facts. Uh, inerrancy is something that is, is hard to define, and there are many people that, that they think they have defined inerrancy, but what they really mean is that their interpretation is inerrant. But I think it's better to keep this definition simple, the idea that what we see in Scripture is not contrary to fact, and that it communicates accurately the truth that it is intending to communicate by the author. The fourth step from God to us is canonicity, that God's people recognized and collected inspired books as authoritative for faith and practice. It wasn't just all decided. They were not cherry-picked for theological agenda, but it was rather God's people over a large amount of time um, recognizing, collecting, setting aside, said this book has inspiration quality. That one doesn't. It might be good for other reasons, but I'm not going to set it aside as, as authoritative for our faith and for our practice. The fifth part here is transmission. That's that process of copying the original language, the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, to preserve them for future generations and to distribute them for greater use so that a new church down the road and in, in, in the neighboring nation and country that we can plant churches there and they can have God's word to use over in those places. So we need to copy these. But in the process of copying, there are variants that are introduced. Sometimes those variants are honest mistakes. It's the same way that you and I make honest mistakes while we're hand copying. Sometimes those variants are, are on purpose, um, uh, usually by well-meaning scribes who think that they're trying to help, uh, but they're really, really not helping when those variants are introduced. But we talked about that earlier in class. And then number six, textual criticism. Textual criticism is that art and science applied to ascertain the original wording of the text. We take all of those manuscripts from the New Testament. We have more than 5,800. From the Old Testament, we have, again, thousands of manuscripts from the Old Testament. And we compare them and we, we apply science to understand what the date of them, those manuscripts are. We look at tendencies of scribes. And by applying the principles of textual criticism, we can figure out... Um, with a very, very high level of certainty what the original autograph of the original author most likely said. And the times where we have a little bit of question, um, none of them are major doctrinal issues. There are issues like, did it, does it say uh, we go or we should go? Little things like that. All right. And then the next and final step is translation. Through, which is the act through which the content of the original text is transferred from the source language, that would be the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic, into the target language for us English today, resulting in equivalent content, in equivalent as possible content, that the idea that we think in English is as close to the idea as the original author and audience were thinking in their language. There it is, guys. We've wrapped up our, our class. Don't leave yet. We're going to uh, do the class review. Um, but just a reminder that our final exam is coming up a week from today on Thursday, and we'll see you then. The study guide is there available for you.